Good afternoon, everyone. I'm certainly honored to be here to uh, present to uh, you folks this afternoon. It's been a lot of years since I last was involved with the International Fire Stop Council, so it's great to be back. It's great to see a lot of old friends that I haven't seen for a number of years. So thanks for the opportunity. And uh, most of you know me already, Rich Walkie, formerly with Underwriters Laboratories. I uh, spent actually 43 years working for UL, and uh, I recently retired. I retired from UL on Thanksgiving Day of last year. And uh, the original plan is I was going to retire on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, but I had so many things I needed to get done that I didn't make that Wednesday. I actually uh, walked into our security department at 1.30 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning to drop off my laptop and ID badge and those sort of things. So that was my official uh, the retirement, I suppose, on Thanksgiving Day. But uh, since then, I uh, have uh, founded a small consulting firm. I'm doing some consulting. And uh, what I'll say is my original reason for retiring from UL is not that I didn't enjoy what I was doing. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my career at UL. I thoroughly enjoyed what I was doing. But I just got tired of doing it for, f for 50, 60 hours a week. So I thought I would uh, retire and do consulting for maybe 20 hours a week. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on perspective, that consulting has now gotten up to 50 or 60 hours a week again. So I'm still in the same boat as I was before, but, but I am enjoying it, thor thoroughly enjoying what I'm doing. Let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, most of you in this room know me, maybe some of you do not, but uh, for the benefit of those folks who will be reviewing this, seeing this on the video later on. I'll, I'll give you my background. Uh, I graduated from Valparaiso University in 1976 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering. I went to work for UL immediately thereafter. And for roughly the first 29 years of my life, I was actively involved in the conduct of engineering investigations and supervising those investigations over a wide range of products that were used in the built environment. Of significance to you folks, though, is uh, for a lot of years, from 1987 through 2004, I headed up the what I will loosely call the fire stopping group at UL, the group that was involved with your industry, conducting tests on you know, methods of protecting penetrations, and ultimately joint systems, perimeter fire containment, duct wrap systems, those sort of things. So, so that's, I guess, how I, I came to get involved with, uh, with your industry. When I started in the fire stopping group, UL had roughly 200 fire stop systems and about five joint systems. As of, uh, I guess it was Monday of this week, we had uh, 7,456 published fire stop systems. We have 2,233 joint systems and 226 perimeter fire containment systems. So I've seen a lot of growth in the industry during my time of involvement. And uh, when I said I headed up the fire stopping group at UL, back in those days, it, it meant I was involved in pretty much everything associated with the industry. Certainly I was involved in uh, the standards development process. I was involved in the day-to-day -day activities associated with the test investigations. Back in those days, I would review every test plan that was sent out by one of our engineers to a manufacturer. I'd review every single test report that was issued. I, again, I was involved in uh, standards development. I was involved in code development, something that uh, nowadays somebody in that position wouldn't do. We have people at UL that do that for them nowadays. And of course, I was involved in the, the normal crisis of the day type of activity, which occurs in any business. So, so I really had the opportunity to learn a lot about this business and, and conduct you know, a lot of different, uh, or, or be involved in a lot of different things during that period of time. A couple of things I'm particularly proud of is the development of the test standard that we now have for joint systems, both the UL standard and the ASTM standard, and likewise for perimeter fire containment. You know, between you know, Bob Berhanek, Chris Johnson, and myself at UL, you know, we were really the ones who made it all happen, developed this, the test method kind of conceptually, developed the test equipment, built the test equipment. Uh, got involved in, in the standards writing, got involved in code development, working closely with the International Fire Stop Council, and specifically Vicki Lovell was a code consultant. So we worked very closely with her to get code requirements relating to those two areas. So 
it was a long, hard struggle, a lot of disagreements in those periods of time, but we got through it, and now we have some very well-defined standards, well-defined code requirements for those types of products, which, of course, gives your industry the opportunity to market the products and systems that you, um, you manufacture. And uh, I guess above all else, though, I met a lot of great people over the years from the industry, and uh, certainly most of those people I, to this day, still call friends and will forever call friends. So that's why it's so good to be down here today and, and meet with all of my old friends from days gone by. For the last 14 years of my career, I worked in a department at UL called the Codes and it either codes and advisory services or codes and regulatory services. They had a couple different names over the years. But that's the group at UL that interfaces with the code enforcement community. And for that matter, also with the architects and uh, contractors. So uh, we did a lot of different activities to try to uh, I guess I'll say educate the code officials, make sure the code officials understand what UL does, how we do it, and uh, how our listings are used to show compliance with the codes that they're force in charged with enforcing. So indirectly, we are promoting all of you folks as manufacturers' products. We're promoting the use of your UL listed and uh, you know, other tests and laboratories also, but listed product systems and assemblies. So, so that was really our role. We did it in a lot of different ways. I was heavily involved in educational activities. Uh, heavily involved in code development activities and uh, also answered literally thousands and thousands of technical inquiries from you know contractors architects and code officials from the field so uh, it gave me a, a lot of good diverse background and it was a great learning opportunity to work with that department in something you know now I'm taking advantage of advantage of and enjoying as a consultant that that learning experience I had I also was involved in code development activities very heavily. I had the honor of sitting on the ICC Fire Safety Committee, the last two code cycles with ICC. And they're really the committee that votes on the code proposals that are put forward by you know, industry, associations, code officials, manufacturers, and so on and so forth. And as part of that, we heard about 250 proposals for each of those two cycles. And my job as a committee member was to uh, read all the proposals, understand all the proposals, and be ready to talk about all those proposals as they're discussed on the code floor, and be willing to and able to express my opinion on the validity of a particular proposal or the, the fallacies of that proposal in front of a group of about 500 people live and who knows how many people viewing online. So, so it really was a, a great challenge, a great opportunity, tremendous learning experience. Likewise, I played on the NFPA side of the house. I was involved in the NFPA Fire Protection Features Committee, uh, along with uh, the 220, 221, and 5000 uh, uh, Technical Committee on Building Construction. So they're the groups at, at NFPA that do the same sort of thing as I was doing on the, NFP, on the ICC side of things also. So again, great learning opportunity. I certainly cherish the experiences and the, what I learned from those experiences. So, Again, I retired from UL in November, and nowadays I am, am consulting a bit. And uh, when Jim asked me to present here, I you know, was really excited about that opportunity. And ultimately, the program that I'm presenting here today, Fire Stopping Past, Present, and Future, is what uh, my good friend Luke Woods and I did down at the FCIA Fall Conference, also here in Miami. Uh, we we kind of recapped where the industry has been, where it is now, and where we think it might be going in the future. So I'm repeating that program essentially here today, modified a, a bit, of course. And I guess I'd like to thank you know both FCIA and Bill McHugh for allowing me to represent the same material to you folks. Also like to thank UL because in reality I developed most of the content of this program while I was still at UL. So uh, those folks are certainly were receptive to me representing this material to you folks. So glad I had the opportunity to do that. So, uh, so the next hour or so, hour and a half or so, I'm gonna share some of that institutional knowledge that I was involved with in the early days of fire stops and you know, try to recap how the industry got to where it is today. So uh, we'll uh, you know, go through the slides. There's a lot more information probably on the slides than we have time to discuss in detail today. So some of them will just be kind of bullet points on slides. 
but uh, I will be here through tomorrow late afternoon. If anybody has any questions or want to talk about it further, I'd be happy to uh, just talk about it with anybody. The last slide will include my contact information. And I say I'm a consultant, so uh, you know I would love to hear from any of you at any point on you know any topic you might want to talk about. I'd be happy to answer whatever questions you might have in the future. I'm just an email or phone call away. And uh, it's, it, I, I like getting phone calls from old friends, so, uh, so feel free to contact me in the future. So let's get started with the past and, and uh, how this industry evolved. Anybody recognize this photo? First Interstate Bank, yeah, exactly. And uh, I was in Los Angeles last fall for a conference, downtown LA, and I go to Los Angeles probably three or four times a year, but I never, ever go to downtown LA. Literally, this was the first time last fall since this fire. So as I'm Ubering into the hotel from the airport, I was peering out the window looking for the building, wondering if I would recognize it. Sure enough, I did recognize it. It's now the Aeon building. And uh, anyway, it was rebuilt. And you know, th this fire had you know a, a huge bearing on the development of the fire stopping industry because you know one of the culprits and reason fire spread from the 12th to the 16th floor in this fire was due to improperly protected penetrations and an unprotected you know perimeter void. So uh, this this fire was very significant to the industry, and that's why I did put this photo on this slide. So let's then look at how the industry developed. Uh, really, the industry started in the 60s, primarily from the marine application. And uh, the fire stop systems in those days were very crude. They were typically steel pipes welded to the uh, metallic bulkhead or, or deck. And uh, cables or pipes were passed through those uh, steel pipes, through the bulkheads. And then there was some sort of method of plugging the ends of those steel sleeves, and that was your fire stopping system. And uh, eventually, the fire stopping evolved from the marine industry to the nuclear power industry and ultimately to the commercial construction world. The 1993 standard building code published by SBCCI had requirements for fire stopping, basically said all openings around exposed pipes or power shafting shall be, approved, shall be filled with an approved non-combustible material or shall be closed off by close-fitting metal caps at the ceiling and floor lines, lines on each side of the wall or partition. Pretty crude by today's standards, right? You know, basically that relied on the code official to make a decision. Of, of what is an appropriate material. That word approved by code language means acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction. So put a lot of responsibility on the part of that code official to make a decision on what is an approved non-combustible material. But that was the early days of fire stopping. Now, does that mean in 1993 that we had fire stopping requirements around the country? No, what that means is SBCCI published that code in 93, I'm sorry, in 73. The, from the code world, a particular edition of the code or is just words on paper until it is formally adopted by specific state or local jurisdictions. Once it's adopted, then it is a requirement, then it is code. But oftentimes, that code adoption process lags several, if not many years behind the actual publication of the code. You know, I live in a, a little sleepy suburban Chicago town, and uh, up until December of 2018, my town was on the 2000 International Residential Code and International Building Code. It's kind of an embarrassment, to be honest. And uh, I always said that when I retired from UL, I was going to go into that building department, introduce myself, and volunteer my time to bring them up into the modern era. But they beat me to it. They did adopt the 18 codes as of... Uh, December of 18, so, uh, so now we're in the right decade at least. But anyway, so, uh, so we, were, we were starting to see requirements in the, in the uh, early 70s. <clears throat> and then we had the Browns Ferry nuclear power plant fire in uh, March of 1975. And that fire really woke a lot of people up in terms of the need for fire stopping. The uh, fire stop systems in that building consisted of a foam plastic covered with a fire retardant coating and uh, you know, didn't do a good job and was a contributing factor to the, a near nuclear disaster. So it was very pivotal for the fire stopping industry to recognize that that wasn't working. We need to do something more scientific and more thorough. 
So shortly after that fire, both UL and the code groups recognized that fire stopping was an issue and needed to be addressed seriously. So UL actually started doing research on the development of a specific test standard relating to fire stopping right away in, in 1975. And there were two people at UL that spearheaded this effort from our perspective, Leon Prisabilla, who very, very brilliant fire protection engineer, went far at UL and before he finally retired about five years ago, and then Abdur Abbasi, and uh, he left UL not long after this, but uh, and, and the reason I, I guess I'll say I bring up his name is uh, before this involvement, he was a door guy. He was a guy who was doing the testing of fire door assemblies. So we're going to see some legacy traits from the door industry fall into the, get into the fire stopping industry as a result of, of his involvement. So we'll talk more about that as we go along. So uh, you all published its first fire stop system for Nelson Electric in 1976. And that listing really was addressing the nuclear power industry. And we published that listing under a product category we called wall opening protectives, multiple, multiple cable devices. And it was a product listing. It wasn't a system like we see today. It was a, a simply a product listing, a kind of a one line description of what that product is. And, how it's used and its rating. So we, at that point, did not get into the concept of a system yet. Of significance here, we called it wall opening protectives. You know, in code language, an opening protective is a door or a fire window. And various other industries have tried to steal that phrase over various periods of time. And this is where Abdur Abbasi's door experience came into play. For him, anything that was a breach, void, gap, opening, and a rated assembly was an opening protective. But that wasn't really the case. Opening protective is a door or a window. But he stole that phrase and applied it to, you know, basically what we now call fire stop systems. And uh, it may not have been the smartest thing to do in retrospect. We had to make a change later on to correct that situation. But uh, anyway, uh, we later renamed this category wall and floor opening protectives when we started running fire stop systems through floor assembly or protected openings and floor assemblies. Ultimately, we renamed it through penetration fire stop devices and then later yet just simply fire stop devices. Fire stop devices is the category that you all use nowadays to cover those you know, collar type products. And the, I guess the important thing is we didn't yet have a standard in those early days. So what we were doing is we were listing those products based on a fire test conducted using an ASTM E119 or UL263 time temperature curve. And you still see that language in the code today, don't we? Annular space protection materials, my least favorite section of the code that should be removed. But in any case, uh, that was the methodology we had available. We obviously recognized that moving forward, we do need to publish a standard, and uh, you know, ultimately we did. But uh, beyond that, we, we moved forward uh, a few years later and developed a fire stop system for Semco covering a silicone foam, again, nuclear target for that product. And then we again covered under that product category, wall and floor opening protectives, multiple cable systems. So we changed that word device to systems, and this is where we introduced the concept, not we, I'm not with UL anymore, this is where UL introduced that concept of a system approach. And uh, so again, though, we based that listing on testing in accordance with an E109 time temperature curve, not an actual fire stop standard. By uh, December of 80, UL had 23 published fire stop systems and four fire stop device product listings. And uh, the product category, wall opening, I'm sorry, wall and floor opening protectives, multiple cable devices, ultimately got changed to through penetration fire stop devices in 1982. So we started moving forward with some correct terminology, eliminating that phrase opening protectives as it relates to a protection of a fire stop system. And uh, ultimately, likewise, we renamed the category uh, wall and floor opening protectives, multiple cable systems to through penetration fire stop systems in 82. The same year we made the other change in the naming. 
Of significance then, UL began testing Firestop systems to UL 1479 in late 1982. We'll talk about the development of that standard, but we'll find that standard was formally published as a standard early, well, January of 1983. So that was a relative time frame where we actually had developed a published standard on Firestop systems. And, you know, when I think back about it, I came into the group in 87, so that, you know, didn't predate me by much, did it? But in uh, any case, uh, the early listings for Firestop systems were published in what UL called the Building Materials Directory. You know, that was the directory that we typically covered items such as, you know, surface burning characteristics, uh, flame spread smoke developed, uh, uh, products of that type, things that were not hourly rated assemblies. Why did we put Firestop systems into our Building Materials Directory? Real simple because Abdur Abbasi, the gentleman I talked about before, was in the door industry, had been testing for the door industry, and that's where the door listings were published. So for him, it was natural to put it in the building materials. When I came into the group and, you know, we, we recognized perhaps that wasn't the right place for fire stop systems, nor for that matter was it the right place for doors. So we ultimately transferred all that information over into the uh, fire resistance directory in 1989. Anybody still have a copy of that old building materials directory with those fire stops? A few, yeah, Tony, you would, yes, absolutely. I do too. I have a complete collection of uh, both fire resistance and building materials directory going back to 1976. And uh, now, someday I'm going to move. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them, but they're neat to have for us fire geeks, I guess. Uh, anyway, better move on here. And, uh, you know, Again, let's go back to the development of UL 1479, how that came about. As I mentioned before, Browns Ferry nuclear fire had a big impact on the industry and was really what prompted UL to begin publishing or developing that standard. So we began addressing that issue in 1975. And uh, likewise, the codes recognized the need for a published standard and robust requirements in the code for protecting penetrations. So the idea of developing a standard on a penetration, or for that matter, a joint system, or a door, or a damper, was we look at what are the basic requirements for fire resistance? What are we trying to do with fire resistance? We're trying to contain the fire, limit temperature rise, make sure it has stru structural integrity, those sort of things. So when we developed UL 1479, what we did is we looked at you know, those as kind of the, the goals of this standard, but now how do we need to adapt E119 to address the nuances of a fire stop system? Fire stop system, let, let's just say, is a, as an example, a four inch diameter pipe through a floor or wall. Do I need a 17 foot by 14 foot test sample to evaluate one four inch conduit? Realistically not. So that was one of the things we did. We scaled down the sample size, made the sample size meaning the floor wall construction size, relative to the fire stop systems that were being evaluated. We looked at differential pressure, because now we have a concern about does differential pressures between the fire room and the room outside the fire push hot gases through that fire stop system? Absolutely, so that was a consideration. How long should the penetrating item be above or below the, the floor wall assembly? We had to look at the methods of measuring temperatures, methods of applying thermocouple pads to those thermocouples. It was all little different, unique with fire stopping. Also the rating criteria. We looked at you know, developing two criteria, an F and a T rating. What's the fallacy of a metal pipe? Obviously it conducts heat, it gets hot. So if we were to strictly apply the requirements of ASTM E119 for fire resistance, we would have to apply a temperature limitation and a metallic pipe typically wouldn't meet that requirement. So, so anyway, we came up with that concept of an F and T rating. So uh, ultimately, the first edition of uh, ASTM's version of the standard, E814, was published in 1982. And the UL's edition of the standard, UL 1479, was published in January of 2000, I'm sorry, January of 1983. We did begin, as I said before, publishing fire stop systems to UL 1479 late in 1982. So yes, we jumped the gun a bit in terms of publishing systems to that standard that technically wasn't published and available yet. Realistically, the standard had passed the balloting process, so it was just a matter of the logistics of getting it to press and getting it out to the public. So anyway, late 82 was the date we began formally saying we were testing to 1479. 
UBC is the Uniform Building Code published by the International Conference of Building Officials back in the legacy code days. And uh, ICBO, or International Conference of Building Officials, had the practice of developing their own test standards that basically replicated the requirements of either an ASTM or a UL standard. To this day, I'm not quite sure why they needed to do that, but, but they did. In uh, any case, they published a standard 43-6 in 1991, which basically mirrored the requirements of ASTM E814 and UL1479. And I guess I should say, you know, when these two standards were published, in reality, they were one and the same, you know, a couple of covered the same test equipment, same instrumentation, same conditions of acceptance, so it could be considered one and the same. So uh, now let's go back to the codes and see what the code was doing in that period of time. So uh, ICBO, International Conference of Building Officials, was really leading the charge during that era through their Uniform Building Code requirements, UBC, and uh, ultimately when you, we looked at the 79 through 88 editions of the code, the uh, requirements for penetration said, penetrations through walls, floors, ceilings, which require protected openings, shall be protected. And it goes on to say, uh, uh, are, need, they need to be fire stopped with an approved material, securely installed and capable of maintaining its integrity when subjected to a time temperature curve prescribed in UBC standard 43-1, in other words, ASME 109 or UL 263 for the specific assembly. So in that era, the code still referenced that ASTM time temperature curve. And it took a while to get beyond that point and start publish or start referencing the published fire stop standards. And then the code went on to talk about requirements for electrical boxes, that infamous 16 square inch maximum size, no more than 100 square inch per 100 square foot, and the boxes on opposite sides of the wall need to be separated by 24 inches. So that's pretty much what the code reads today. Obviously, there's a lot of exceptions to today's codes, but that's pretty much the language code has today. Then it went on to talk about uh, outlet boxes of other materials, i.e. plastic, need to be evaluated through a fire test conducted to the time temperature curve of ASME 109 or UL 263. And then it went on to say occasional non-combustible pipes may be installed within or through floors provided they are protected so as to prevent the movement of hot flames and gases. Wow, that's a throwback, isn't it? Doesn't give you a lot of information, doesn't give the code official much information on which to go on, but ultimately it was you know, up to the code official to make a decision on what occasional non-combustible pipes really meant and how do we protect them from movement of hot flames and hot gases. Probably that meant, you know, a blanket material, either ceramic or mineral wool, but uh, it was pretty vague. When we got to the 91 UBC, pretty much it all got clarified. And uh, now all of a sudden we had reference to t systems tested to the new fire stop standards, E814 and UL 1479. So ultimately what it required is that the penetrations be protected. And, and maybe I'll, I'll backtrack and say penetrations through walls which required protected openings. So what does that really mean? What it means is the requirements for penetrations were triggered only if the code also required opening protectives, in other words, doors to be listed, tested and listed. So if the code didn't require testing to listed doors, we didn't need to protect penetrations through those walls. So anyway, and then it went on to say, and floors shall be protected with the through penetration fire stop systems tested to UBC standard 43-6, in other words, the fire stop standards, having, and having an F and T rating, and there were some exceptions which waived the T rating requirement in certain circumstances as there is today in the current codes. But then it went on to talk about uh, non-combustible penetrating items not larger than four inches in diameter or 16 square inch in area may penetrate walls and floors provided the annular space is filled with a material that pre prevents the passage of flames and hot gases sufficient to ignite cotton waste when subjected to a, a UBC standard 43-1 or UL263 ASME 119 time temperature curve under a minimum positive pressure. So now what we did is we retained that throwback to the early years where we didn't have a fire stop system. And this is probably my 
least favorite provision in chapter seven of the IBC. Nobody's testing to these systems. There is no real reason to keep this language, but yet it's still there. And uh, you know, I encourage the industry to perhaps try to uh, get that out of the code. I would certainly be supportive of that concept and willing to work with uh, Tony to, to make that happen. But uh, it has no significance nowadays. And then the requirements for outlet boxes carried forward from the earlier codes. We talked about that one also. So that was how the code evolved. So now we're to the point 91 UBC. We now have tested listed systems tested to the Firestop standards. As time moved forward, though, there was a, a rapid advancement of the fire stopping industry, both in terms of the number of manufacturers involved, the number of systems that were tested, along with some evolutionary changes to those standards. And I was party to most all of these changes we're going to talk about now, other than the first one. In 1985, we reduced the magnitude of positive pressure between the furnace environment and the environment in the lab outside the furnace from 0.03 inch water column to 0.01 one inch water column. And quite honestly, I do not know what the background on that was, what prompted us to do that. I do know you all did some research and uh, basically measured the performance of fire stop systems through fire testing at different pressures and ultimately concluded that the magnitude of pressure is not critical. What's critical is whether there is positive pressure in the furnace or not. So that's what, what kind of supported this change, but what really prompted it, I don't know, never seen that. Or if I did, I've forgotten it since then. But uh, any case, uh, ultimately then, you know, we, ha we had these Firestop device product listings prior to 91 where, again, the listing of a Firestop device, those collar products, was basically just one line of text talking about the product for use in gypsum board wall assemblies, uh, having a one hour rating or whatever the case may be. So we recognized that as time had marched forward, those fire stop devices, those collars, were now being used with other fire stopping components, maybe a putty, maybe a caulking material. And we, we kind of thought, why should we be publishing these as product listings? Let's just make them systems like all other fire stop systems are systems. So, so we converted those into systems in 1991. And uh, another very significant activity that took place in that relative era is in 1992, there was one manufacturer in the industry who manufactured intumescent wrap strip products who withdrew those products from the marketplace in recognition of, or, of perceived aging issues. The product, in their opinion, wasn't continuing to perform based on its tested listings after exposure to the elements for even a relatively short period of time. So there, there was an aging factor that was reducing the performance of that material. So they were through that product from the marketplace, but it got the industry talking about, should we be looking at the longevity or aging performance or performance over time of Firestop systems? So they brought that to UL and, and uh, UL you know, likewise had similar thoughts that yes, maybe this should be looked at as part of the listing. Originally, we wanted to apply it to all fire stopping materials. And uh, also, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll say this, this led to about an eight year project to kind of study the, the topic and try to make some decisions. And in the perfect world, I would have said, or did say in the early days, is that really what we need to do is we need to pick a time frame that these fire stop systems needed to perform. Whether that was 25 years, 50, 75, 100, I don't know, I don't care, but we need, I, I always thought we needed to pick that time and we needed to evaluate all products to confirm that they will perform for that period of time. So in the process of doing the research, I had a meeting with a, <coughs> excuse me, a gentleman up in Toronto who was involved in that sort of activity for the uh, military aircraft industry. And what we quickly learned during that meeting is, yes, the technology does exist to be able to evaluate products and be able to state definitively that that product would be good for 25 years in such and such an environment. But the cost, thank you, the cost of that work was so astronomical that it, it, it worked great when you're trying to sell a $75 million Northrop Grumman FA-18 fighter plane. But when you're trying to sell fire stopping to the commercial world, it just 
wasn't a practical solution. So we kind of backed down on what our requirements were and we kind of decided let's just apply a certain standardized set of requirements to all materials and, uh, and after exposure to these conditions, and, and I'd say all materials, let me backtrack, not all materials, intumescent fire stop systems. We, we pared the program down just to look at the intumescent type of products where we needed them to continue to be able to react, expand, exert pressure, and close off the system. So, so we came up with some standardized conditions for aging and high humidity, applied that across the board, and ultimately evaluated the performance of the materials through intermescent expansion pressure testing and the expansion factor testing. And uh, there were some, some allowances for slight deterioration of performance, but in essence we were saying that the products continue to perform after those exposure conditions. So that was a big deal for the industry. It took a lot of years to reach that decision and a lot of years to do the testing and put it in place. Keep in mind, when we're talking aging, this is real-time aging, so you don't do that overnight. So it was an extended project to do that. Another thing we did in 92 was to renumber all of our fire stop systems from simply an alpha numbering system, one, two, three, four, five, to an alpha numeric system that identified through the numbering system, what is the significance of that particular system? What type of assembly can it be used for? What's the penetrating item? So we did that for two reasons, I guess. One is to be able to subdivide these thousands, now thousands of fire stop systems into smaller groups that we looked at the numbering sequence, we knew what it covered. But beyond that, we wanted to take the opportunity to rewrite the systems all in a standardized language. And we saw the handwriting on the wall with the electronic searches, electronic databases. You know, Al Gore hadn't yet invented the internet. Well, I shouldn't say the internet did exist, but it wasn't used in the way certainly it's used today. But we saw the handwriting on the wall, so we wanted to put these systems into a standardized format. So we started by developing a shell, a template. All systems were reformatted into that template and then republished with these new numbering sequence. So now, everyone in this room very quickly can tell me what a CAJ 1079 system is. A typical architect, contractor, code official may or may not be able to tell you that, but with a little bit of studying and just looking at one table, we know that that's a fire stop system, can be used to penetrate either a floor or a wall assembly of relatively thin sections, and it's a metallic penetrating item and it's the 79th such system. So there is meaning to that alphabet soup. And to be honest, a lot of people I talk about, they do not recognize that there's meanings to those numbers and letters. But uh, anyway, so that was in 92. Uh, we added an L rating to UL 1479 in 1993. L rating, we called it a leakage rating, but the reality is it was focused on smoke leakage. And what prompted all this was the NFPA 101 Life Safety Code had provisions that uh, required penetrations through smoke barriers to resist free passage of flames and hot gases. I'm sorry, smoke and hot gases, rather. And uh, people were asking the question, what does that really mean? Do I, if I stuff it with mineral oil, is that okay? If I have a bundle of cables, do I need to separate the cables to f put fire stopping caulking material sealant between those cables? What does that really mean? So we wanted to develop a quantifiable method of measuring that leakage through the system. So we borrowed some technology that had been in place in Germany, some technology that was actually being simultaneously applied to the door industry. And uh, ultimately, published some changes to the UL 1479 in 1993. And this rating was an optional rating. It uh, was done at a 0.3 inch water column at ambient and 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, one of the big issues that we had in developing this is what should the acceptance criteria be? And you know, it depends on what's in the smoke, right? What's the relative toxicity of that smoke? And you know, we or nobody was really prepared to answer that question, so we finally decided we were just going to publish the numbers and let the code groups decide what is really acceptable or not. And so that's what was done. So those uh, listings were put in place starting with the 1994 Fire Resistance Directory. And we'll talk more about code requirements in just a few minutes, but it took and from 1993 until the 2006 edition of the IBC to get quantified code requirements into the code. 
And uh, let's see, continuing, we've made some minor revisions of the pre positive pressure requirements of the standard in 94. W rating, water leakage rating, was added to the standard in 2004. And when we first started talking about adding a W rating or water rating to the fire stop standard, the original thought was we were concerned about water migration floor to floor. In other words, if that floor gets wet, the fire stop system gets wet, will it allow water to seep to the floor below? But it uh, didn't take too long into that process before we started recognizing, no, there's a bigger question. If that fire stop system gets wet, will it continue to perform its function as a fire stop system once it's allowed to dry out? And so that ultimately really became the, the real issue with the W rating is, uh, you know, we would subject these assemblies to water exposure. We established three classes of exposure from the marine industry. The only one that this industry, or has relevance to this industry is class one. It's a three foot water column exposure for 72 hours. During that period of time, there could be no leakage through the fire stop system from the top to the bottom. But then what we do is we dry out that fire stop system and then subject it to its fire exposure and develop the an F&T rating after exposure to the water. So that was really the, the real reason for an F rating. I'm, I'm sorry, W rating is to make sure the materials will still continue to perform after exposure to that water. And we published our first listings for W ratings in 2005. Those requirements you know, still exist. There's nothing in the code, probably never will be. But uh, for building owners, to, to me, that's where this really applies. And uh, I, I think I mentioned before, I do a lot of teaching to code officials, to architects and contractors. In particular, when I'm teaching to contractors and architects, I always you know, suggest that they have a conversation with their building owners, with their clients, on a W rating. If I was a building owner, you know, I, I think I'd probably recognize that, yes, there are occasional plumbing leaks in a building. Yes, occasionally we might have an inadvertent sprinkler activation. I had one in my office when I was working at UL in Santa Clara. Made a huge flood. So those things happen. We have roof leaks, window leaks, et cetera. So in the life of a building, it's certainly not inconceivable that those fire stop systems could get what? If they do get what, do you want to have to replace them? You know, it's a lot more difficult to replace an existing building in a, than it is to put in the right system to begin with. So I encourage architects to have that conversation with their building owners beforehand and, and plan for these sort of events should they happen. But anyway, uh, moving on, uh, the standard was revised in, I should say UL 1479 was revised in 2015 to include testing procedures for membrane penetrations through wall assemblies and that covered both outlet, outlet box penetrations and also typical pipe penetrations. So that is now a part of the requirements. We'll talk more about the requirements for membrane penetrations for horizontal assemblies when we start talking about future activities. Another thing that happened in the industry uh, is uh, the concept of an approved qualified contractor. Uh, FCIA, Firestop Contractors International Association, spearheaded this issue since they're a contractor-based organization. And initially they set up a program with uh, Factory Mutual, or now FM Global. And uh, it, it's a uh, FM 4991 approved Firestop contractor program that basically requires the contractor you know, demonstrate experience and competency and good business practices, have a quality control process in place uh, it uses the concept of a designated responsible individual, DRI, who is formally tested by Factory Mutual for their competency and knowledge of the industry requirements. And uh, a few years thereafter, UL jumped on that bandwagon and developed a similar sort of program we call a UL a Qualified Fire Stop Contractor. Likewise, UL Seed did the same sort of thing for the Canadian marketplace. So those programs are in place to, I guess I'll say, set or raise the bar for those contractors who choose to pursue this sort of a, a program with either FM or UL. And I am a firm believer that the, these folks who are involved in this process do excel as compared to the you know, more typical contractor, uh, in particular the situations where the fire stops are installed by the trades. But maybe I'll get off that uh, before I say something I shouldn't. Uh, 
But uh, so now let's switch gears. We're going to talk about the development of UL 1479 covering joint systems. So a little different subject. And uh, you all began the development of that standard in 1992. But the reality was, there was nothing new for you all to be testing joint systems. We ran our first test on a joint system in 1960. It was ahead of all joint system, and I won't necessarily say who the test sponsor was, but way back in 1960, which when you think about it, was not long after the rapid uh, expansion on the use of gypsum board for our wall constructions. The, the gypsum industry recognized that if you, if you had a load-bearing, I'm sorry, if you had a, a floor assembly above a non-load-bearing wall, that that deflection of the floor would very quickly damage the gypsum board. So they recognized the need for head-of-wall drain systems in 1960. And then we also ran a number of floor-to-floor uh, -floor type of joints in the uh, early 80s and actually set up our first published listing on a joint system in 1984. So it was here it was uh, eight years later before we started developing the standard, but uh, we put together draft of the standard and uh, ultimately, you know, went through the standards development process. And there was, uh, you know, lots of, uh, I say, lots of controversy during this period of time. Certainly, there was a certain portion of the industry that wanted to maintain the concept of requiring a ASTM E119 full scale, 14 foot by 17 foot test sample for that small little joint system. UL tended to be a little more practical and suggested that maybe we don't need a sample size that large and, and ultimately a test that costly just to evaluate these joints. So, so there was a lot of give and take during that period of time on the development of the standard. But ultimately we put together a standard that addressed the nuances of joint systems. You know, obviously the sample size was a big issue. The uh, sample was, or the standard was developed based on a length to width ratio for the joint system. Let's maintain a minimum ratio of 10 to 1. We need a positive pressure, and uh, the method of measuring the temperature needed to change a little bit from E119. But the other issue with joint systems is why are they put into buildings? They're put there because they're intended to accommodate building movement. So we set up a uh, uh, preconditioned cycling of those joint systems that's conducted prior to the fire test. And then ultimately, as far as the acceptance criteria, we uh, set up a criteria where we develop an assembly rating, which more or less tracked ASTM E119 for the basic barrier in which those joints are installed, meaning it included passage of fire, temperature rise, and structural integrity. And then we also created an L rating, le air leakage rating through these joint systems, like we had done earlier for the fire stops. That standard was published in November of uh, 1994 and the, a counterpart standard was in, under development simultaneously at ASTM, and ASTM ultimately published E1966 in 1998. So now let's look at some of the evolutionary changes of the listings of joint systems over time. And again, the 90s brought about a very rapid acceleration of the t activities associated with joints. And uh, I can remember counting back in those days, it literally meant turning pages and manually counting the number of joint systems that you all had published within one year of releasing that standard. And it was like 500 systems in a one year time frame. So I, now thinking back, yeah, that's why our lab was always so busy and backlogged and manufacturers were screaming we couldn't get the testing done soon enough. It's because we had such a big influx of work. So anyway, lots of advancements during that period of time. Once again, we renumbered the joint systems in the early days. We numbered them kind of using a fire resistance design concept and ultimately we switched that over to the numbering system we had now. We also used that opportunity to standardize the wording of all those joint systems. And uh, once again, we added a W rating to UL 1479 in 2006, a water rating. And again, like for fire stops, the original thought process, we want to prevent passage of water through the system, so we quickly realized, no, it's more than that. We want to make sure the system still perform after exposure to the water. Same three classes of uh, water leakage that we have for fire stops, and then the assembly rating is determined after that exposure to the water. And uh, currently, though, ironically, there is no listings for W ratings for drink systems. I'm not quite sure why that would be the case for floor to floor. I would think same sort of criteria would apply as would for fire stops, but anyway, that's the reality. 
And uh, continuing on those evolutionary changes, uh, we introduced the methodology for accelerated aging into UL 2079 in December of 14, but it was introduced as an optional program. And same criteria we use for fire stops in terms of aging and high humidity exposure, followed by the expansion pressure, expansion factor testing. Okay, now switch gears again. Let's talk about perimeter fire containment, perimeter fire barriers. Uh, that was an area that, uh, once again, was very controversial over the years. And, you know, UL first began discussing the need for and development of a test procedure for perimeter fire barriers in 1991. And there were a couple fires that occurred, you know, shortly before that that led to this thought process as we need to address this. First Interstate Bank fire, one Meridian Plaza in Philadelphia was a similar situation as uh, First Interstate Bank where we had unprotected perimeter joints. In any case, it got us to thinking, we need to do something about it. But we did a lot of uh, head scratching and beard stroking initially in terms of you know, how do we evaluate this? You know, initial thoughts were, let's use one of our fire resistance furnaces, but you know, we normally don't like open fires within our test buildings, our labs. So you know, this would have had to, would have meant we had an open fire inside the lab. So the bottom line is we really never did put our finger on what would be the appropriate test procedure for these joint systems. And then there was sort of one of those aha moments. And that came when ICBO Evaluation Services published AC-108, which was an intermediate scale test for flammability of combustible components on the exterior of uh, wall assemblies. And uh, that standard was later published as UBC Standard 26-9. And more importantly to you folks nowadays, that standard was later evolved into NFPA 285, that exterior flame spread up the side of the building. Think, you know, Grenwell, uh, tower fire in London two and a half years ago. That's what this test was really intended for. But when we started looking at the parameters of that test, we said, wait a minute, this procedure is very close to what we're looking for for perimeter fire containment. And likewise, uh, Intertech or Megapoint at that time simultaneously began developing a test procedure, as did UL in developing test equipment to use that furnace for the evaluation of these perimeter fire barriers. So uh, ultimately, both labs worked independently, but conceptually ended up at the same point. Yes, there were some nuances different between the two labs, but conceptually we were about the same point. Uh, the uh, test method included cyclical movement as it did for traditional construction joints. Perhaps one of the differences in philosophy between Omega Point and UL is, uh, you know, we said, you know, what direction does the curtain wall move relative to the floor slab? So the answer is real simple. Look at the bracketry. How is that curtain wall attached to the wall? What dimensions does it allow movement? And that's the dimension this assembly was cycled to. Omega Point looked at it just expansion, extension and compression movement. And uh, anyway, so slightly different approach, but you know, at least we both were thinking in terms of the need for movement. And uh, ultimately, UL developed maybe a little more strenuous a little more robust test procedure. We developed an integrity and insulation rating, which really related to the ability of the system to prevent movement of fire from the first floor of this test room to the second floor via any route. That could be through the uh, safing material at the edge of the floor slab, through internally through the curtain wall, or leapfrogging window to window on the outside of the structure. Omega point looked at it a little differently and developed an F&T rating that really related to the fire performance of that uh, safing material and uh, didn't necessarily look at the other routes or other paths of fire progression. Ultimately, ASTM published uh, the standard ASTM 2307 in December, um, yeah, I guess it was December of 2004, pretty much following the path that Omega Point had set forward establishing that F&T rating. So uh, that was a kind of a major breakthrough and, and led to, again, a you know, rapid e acceleration of the number of tests and number of systems that became available for protecting those assemblies. Now, on a slightly different note, let's talk about ASTM E2837. That's that test procedure for the continuity head of wall joint systems where you have a rated wall assembly and a non-rated roof ceiling assembly above it. 
and began, ASCM began working on that standard in 2006 and initially there was some research work done by UL for the Metal Building Manufacturers Association because that's they were the group that was really asking the questions. You know, they had these metal buildings that often included an office up front and a warehouse or manufacturing in the back of the building. They needed to separate that with rated construction. So how do you deal with that head of wall joint system at the top of that assembly? intersecting with the non-rated roof of the metal building. So they came to us, we did some research, kind of developed the methodology that was brought back to uh, ASTM and ultimately published in the form of ASTM E2837. That standard is an uh, active standard. There's not a lot of listings to date. UL has uh, maybe, I'm gonna say about 22, 24. More than that, Tony says more than that, okay. How many do we have, do you know? It's about 35. Is it 35, okay. Okay, so we have about 35 systems nowadays. And uh, I have tried several times, as has in your industry, to get that into the code unsuccessfully. I don't see the, the uh, hesitancy right now. What the code says is that those joints need to be protected with a material, with an approved material that will stay in place and will prevent the passage of flames and hot gases. Now, what does that really mean? I mean, I think we could all intuitively say if you put mineral wool there, it's going to stay in place. It's going to prevent hot flat passage of flames and hot gases. But how do we know, how does a code official know that that's going to stay in place over the life of the building? Code official has no clue. I'm not even sure I could answer that question. And I've seen hundreds of 2079 tests where we cycle the materials, and sometimes the materials don't stay in place. So how can a code official who's never seen that test or fire test make that decision? I don't know. So we're offering them an easy solution, use a tested listed system, and they haven't bought it yet. But uh, we'll keep at it. It will get in. I'm 100% sure of that. So uh, basically, ASTME 2837 develops an F&T rating of the system, and uh, the published standard was, well, the standard was published in 2011, and uh, we published our first continuity head of wall joint system in 2013. Okay, uh, moving on, there, there's two standards that are used for guiding special inspectors on inspections of fire stop and joint systems, ASTM E2174 and ASTM E2393. These two test standards, not test standards, but standards were developed really at the prompting of the Fire Stop Contractors International. They wanted methods by which the ins inspectors could use to judge the installation of the fire stop and joint systems that their contractors were installing. And that process started somewhere around to the year 2000 or maybe shortly thereafter. Well, I guess I have a next slide we'll tell you. The, the, the uh, fire stop version of the standard was published in 2001 and the counterpart standard for joint systems was published in 2004. And, uh, Ultimately, those test procedures serve as the basis for the work a special inspector does on inspecting fire stops. These standards are specifically referenced in Chapter 17 under Special Inspections of Fire Stopping Systems. So let's look at the evolutionary changes of the code requirements from 1996 through the end of the era of the legacy codes. So when I say a legacy code, what I really mean is the codes that existed prior to the International Code Council's series of codes or family of codes. So we had the uh, Southern Building Congress, I'm sorry, Southern Building Code Congress International published a standard building code. Building officials and code administrators published a national building code. And the International Conference of Building Officials published the Uniform Building Code. And Vicki Lovell, as code consultant for the IFC, over the years did a fabulous job of working with these three organizations to more or less come up with some harmonized requirements between these three published codes. You know, back in those days, there was no reason that technically that the three codes needed to read similarly. And oftentimes they didn't read the same, but it created kind of a regional division in terms of where am I building now and what code do I need to follow. So ideally in a perfect world, the three codes would harmonize. And Vicki did a good job of that for the fire stop industry. In part, she did that through a group called the Board for Coordination of the Model Codes, BCMC. They published a report on fire stops and joints uh, back, uh, when was that, 98? I'm trying to think, 
no, it was a little earlier than that, 96 perhaps, that led to the, the harmonization of these legacy codes. And uh, all three codes included provisions for protection of penetrations, where those tests were done either as part of the testing of the floor wall assembly, realistically, never done that way, or based on tests to UL 1479, ASCM E814, the way it's always done. Certainly there were some exceptions to that. We had an exception that said non-combustible penetrants of limited size, limiting the number of floors they pass through, can be protected with concrete grout or mortar to the full thickness of the wall or floor ceiling assembly. Concrete grout and mortar is what I call that. Then we had that infamous annular space protection provision was in each of the three legacy codes. Should have been tossed out back then, but it still exists today. And then it re there were some electrical box exceptions. And then we required you know, fire stop systems and walls to have an F rating, systems and floors to have an F and a T rating, with some exceptions. Ultimately, those uh, three codes also include provisions for the protection of joints. And here's something where I think the groups got derailed. In reality, where the BCMC report got derailed, what they did is they, they came up with a quasi-standard test method and acceptance criteria all in the code to describe how joints were tested. Basically, they said to use a full-scale full test sample per E119 or 263. We'd cycle it. We uh, test it as maximum joint width. We test it under positive pressure. And then we mandate unexposed surface temperatures of that joint. So here it is. The code is dispelling out the test procedures. That's not the way it's supposed to work. There's supposed to be standards behind the scenes talking about how those tests are run. When you know UL or ASTM publishes a fire test standard, it's usually, what, 20, 30 pages long? In the codes, it's about that much text describes the same information. So that, that's not the way the process is supposed to work. But that's the way it was in the last edition of the three codes. And far as perimeter fire containment system, we had you know a whole conglomeration of methods spelled out. UBC was closest to the target, required the protection of those perimeter joints uh, with an ASCME 119 time temperature fire exposure under positive pressure. The system needed to prevent passage of flames sufficient to ignite cotton waste. The SBC, SBC standard building code just required those, uh, those voids to be sealed with an approved material, whatever that may be. And then the NBC was completely silent on perimeter fire protection. So uh, fortunately, we moved forward in roughly, well, I'll say in the late 90s, we began talking about consolidating these three regional codes into one code. And at one point in time, NFPA was also going to be that process, a part of that process. So we were going to basically eliminate, I'll say, four codes converted to one series of codes published by the International Code Council that would be used on a nationwide basis. Ultimately, NFPA got cold feet and backed out of that relationship. So we now still had NFPA codes and ICC codes, but at least we're down to two. First edition of the International Building Code was published in the year 2000. And, uh, the requirements for penetrations in that IBC simply mirrored what was in the last legacy codes. Good news is when it came to joint systems, Vicki Lovell was successful in convincing them that we should reference a test standard, not this quasi-test method in one paragraph of the code. So UL 2079 and ASME 1966 got adopted into the code. In fact, I think the first edition was just 2079, 1966 came with the second edition, the 2003. And then as far as the requirements for perimeter voids, we mirrored what was in the UBC. So now we had that one family of codes which we have lived with since then. ICC does a great job of updating their codes every three years. I'll just go through some of the highlights. I'm running out of time here, but some of the changes were made. Every code edition, we tweaked the out outlet box requirements, coming up with additional exceptions. Someday I'm going to go through and I'm going to simplify all those and minimize that the, the what eight exceptions that now exist, but uh, that's another story. Uh, of significance is with the 2006 edition of the IBC, we now had requirements for an L rating of uh, penetrations through smoke barrier assemblies. And, uh, you know, very, very significant. Took a lot of years from the publication of the standard and listings, but we finally got to the point where we did now have quantifiable requirements in the code. We added ASCM E2307 as the optional test procedure for evaluating perimeter joints. That traditional method of E119 time temperature curve was retained, but at least we had the option of a tested system. 
and then we, we uh, corrected, I guess I'll say, some do loops between the damper section of the code and the penetration section of the code with the 2009 edition. Kind of had a case where section 71, I guess at the time it would have been 716 covering dampers, pointed you to fire stops, and then when you got into the fire stop systems, just pointed you back to the damper. So it was just an endless do loop. So we corrected that with the 2009 edition of the code. Uh, methods of protecting outlet boxes continue to evolve. Uh, with the 2012 code, we, uh, we added a requirement that rated vertical barriers needed to be identified as such above the ceiling line when there is access to this the area above the ceiling. So the idea was when you know Larry the cable guy comes in to install those low voltage cables, he would pull a, pan, a ceiling tile back, look up there, see this marking, recognize this as a fire rated wall assembly and now recognize that he needs to protect those openings that he puts through that barrier. Now it hasn't worked quite as well as it ideally should but it, at least it's a step in the right direction of making people aware these are sacred walls we need to deal with them appropriately. So that was added to the 12 code it's still in the code. Uh, we then added 2307 as the base requirements for protecting perimeter joints with that time temperature curve as a secondary requirement for cases where the glass goes floor to ceiling. Uh, we required uh, special inspections for fire stop systems and fire resistant joint systems for buildings, for high rise buildings. Uh, in other words, greater than 75 foot above fire protection, fire department access and for category risk category three and four buildings. Those buildings we need to remain functional in emergency conditions. So now those buildings require special inspections. We added requirements that the void between a fire barrier and a non-rated roof needed to be filled with an approved material. Again, exactly what that meant, nobody quite knows. Uh, likewise, the uh, gap between an interior rated wall and the curtain wall needed to be filled with an approved material. Again, what that meant, I'm not sure I know. And then once again, we tweaked the requirements for outlet boxes. For the 2018 code, uh, we added requirements uh, that the joint systems needed to be installed in accordance with the published system and manufacturer's installation instructions. Those instructions are part and parcel to the listing. And uh, for the 2021 code, we actually rewrote the requirements for section 715 covering fire resistant joint systems, renamed it joint systems. Uh, it was a, a joint effort. I, I chaired that effort. Uh, John sat in on it. Tony sat in on the effort. Ed sat in on it. So a number of industry folks, a number of code officials that worked together to update the requirements for section 715. We got most of those proposals through. We basically did some reorganization, kind of just shuffled the deck a bit, put things in a more logical order, but then we made some small tweaks to the requirements and a couple of those tweaks didn't quite make it, including the inclusion of that uh, continuity head of wall drain system, didn't make it into the code, but we'll get there sooner or later. Uh, of, I think, true significance also is when we get to the 2021 code, we're now going to require special inspections for our occupancies, residential occupancies, with an occupant load of more than 250 people. It's something that uh, Bill Koffel put through on behalf of FCIA. So we're expanding those applications where special inspections are concerned. And I probably should get on my soapbox and support the concept of special inspections for everything, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll refrain from doing that. That's not the point of today's program. But uh, another change which took place with the 2019 International Fire Code was an update and expansion on the uh, maintenance requirements for fire resistive rated construction. There had been requirements going back to the 12 code that fire resistive constructions needed to be maintained, but the wording was pretty vague in particular for penetrations and fire stops and joints. There was no language really that directly addressed those systems. Well, no, I take that back. There was one, a one line sentence talked about fire stops and joint systems. But, so we rewrote that section of the code, made it a little bit uh, stronger and uh, a little clearer on what's necessary. But the requirements of that chapter of the code is that the building owner has to conduct annual inspections of his fire resistance rated assemblies along with all of the methods of protecting breaches in those assemblies 
and provide or make a report available to the fire code official. Now, is that being done? No, <laughs> John shaking his head. Absolutely, it's not. Do I get on that bandwagon every free training class I do on fire resistance? You bet. I uh, typically my audience is the code officials, not the building owners. So I always, always enforce, reinforce that concept to the fire officials. You need to be asking for those records when you do your inspections. You know, and the realities of it, most fire officials don't have the time or resources to do the inspections as frequently as they should. One lone exception to that, Northbrook, Illinois, you know, where you all is located. Northbrook is a very, very affluent town. Lots of tax dollars coming in, lots of tax dollars going to the fire services. I see Dave Morey, well, I used to see Dave Morey every December. He'd do his annual inspections of our testing facilities. And he was very, very thorough and, and did exactly what he was supposed to do. Why? Because his department had the funding to hire the appropriate number of people and give them the time to do that work properly. Most jurisdictions don't have that luxury. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox here. IFC's role, IFC obviously has played a huge role in the uh, development of this industry over the years. And, uh, you know, I can think back of uh, my first involvement with IFC. It was in 1992. So obviously it was a couple of years after the uh, founding of IFC. But the IFC used to meet in this little, small, tiny conference room in Alexandria, Virginia. It was actually the conference facility of the legal uh, what would I call him, legal liaison for the group, Rand McQuinn, and uh, you know, typical players we had involved in, uh, I know I'm going to miss some of them, so I apologize, but we had, uh, you know, of course, uh, Richard Lick, Tony Schumer, we had Keith Sanford from Hilti, we had Warren Frank from Dow Corning, Bob Schrader at various points in time, we had John Birmingham, oh, Jim Saul Sr., of course, was integral part of that process. Jim McNato from Rector Seal was involved in that process. Uh, who am I missing? Oh, Bernie Krasnoff from uh, BioFire Shield, uh, Louis Zimmerman from IPC, Vicki Floyd, Tom Viverito from uh, Thermal Ceramics, and of course, Vicki Lovell as a code consultant for that group was heavily involved in that process. And then there was an individual who coordinated the association's activities, Richard Byrne. So those are the main players. And again, I'm sure I'm missing some of them. It goes back a lot of years but I'm uh, doing that by memory. But uh, anyway, those folks really set the stage for where we're at today in this industry through code development, through standards development activities, guidelines for engineering judgments. Believe me, there's not a training class I do relating to fire resistance that I don't bring up those IFC guidelines for engineering judgments because they're the only thing out there. And you know, I always tell people, even if I'm teaching doors, for example, or teaching uh, fire resistance that, okay, some of the unique requirements relating to fire stops from those documents don't apply to a fire resistance rated wall, but the concepts be, that are expressed in those documents clearly apply across the board. So I always bring up those documents, great documents. Uh, educational programs, you folks did a lot of training and uh, I guess I'll forego a story I was gonna tell about that. Uh, certainly you work with the master spec type organizations to develop requirements for fire stopping, special inspector certification programs that was being talked about this morning is uh, something that was developed uh, by your your association, obviously marketing. You folks have done a lot of things for marketing fire stops. So, and I'm just touching a, the activities that you folks have been involved with. But you've you've really set the course for this industry over the years. So, any questions on the past? I, I was going to leave some time at the end. We're quickly running out of time, but uh, I do want to make sure I get your questions answered before we move on. And I'm going to be here through the end of the program anyway. So if you had more questions, feel free to reach out to me at any point. So, uh, so let's look at the present. You know, your industry has been an active participant in developing a well-defined set of requirements relating to fire safety of commercial buildings, programs now in place, a well-defined set of code requirements. I always point back to that first interstate bank fire, one Meridian Plaza, you know, MGM, and those sort of fires that occurred in the 70s and 80s. And, and I always say that if those buildings had been built to today's standards, I'm sorry, today's codes, we wouldn't have had those events. We have a very well-defined set of code requirements today that protect those who live, work, and play in the, the various jurisdictions. And I'm firmly convinced that the outcome would be completely different if some of those fires were to occur in a modern building. I think we still have some work to do on the residential front, but that's perhaps another story. Uh, we have a well-defined set of test requirements that complement the codes. 
We have three qualified or approved contractor programs. We have inspection standards for the inspection of the fire stops. We have special inspections required for certain key types of buildings. We have criteria for monitoring the competencies of special inspections. And then we have the new UL uh, Master Audit Certificate of Compliance Program. So ultimately, I think each and, one of, each and every one of you in this room and, and your predecessors should be proud of the work that you've done over the years to get us to where we're at today. So let's just touch on a couple things in the future where this industry might be going. Uh, you know, certainly, I think even to this day, primary objective of this group is, is how we get beyond that point of allowing improperly protected penetrations to continue to be installed. I mean, uh, when I got involved in the industry in 87, we talked about the subject of either improperly protected penetrations or unprotected penetrations. I think we've got beyond the point of Un unprotected penetrations, but we still hear about improperly protected penetrations all the time. I was in Colorado last week teaching two classes on fire resistance and on doors and dampers, and even though I wasn't talking about fire stopping, those, that question came up repeatedly both days about, you know, improperly installed fire stop systems. From the code official's perspective, you know, the contractors are not properly trained, are not doing the job they need to do. From the perspective of the contractors, they point the finger back to the inspectors as not having uniform you know, uh, inspection criteria across the board. So it's a two-way street, clearly, but you know, we need to get beyond that. And there's a lot of things I think we need to do to move that forward. And I see that as perhaps one of the continuing challenges of the industry. You know, but beyond that, you know, what new standards do we need? Do we have all the complete set of standards in place? Or are there other things that can be other standards that can be created. You know, what can the labs do differently? What additional certifications do you folks need? Does the industry need? How can we move that forward? What ed education can be provided and who can provide it and in what forum? Obviously, we have a lot of additional methods of providing education compared to what we had 10 years ago, but we need to look at that, keep working, keep moving. Everyone is doing their part, but it's a never ending process. And then what tools, what do we need to create to move forward? You know, certainly we have two standards writing organizations involved in, in this industry, ASTM and UL. UL typically gets involved in you know, test method standards, testing standards. ASTM has a much broader focus of, of testing of uh, inspections, of uh, qualifications of personnel, uh, field installation practices, and so on and so forth. But you, know, you folks are the ones who have your finger on the pulse of the industry. You know, make sure you convey the needs of the industry to these groups as you have in the past and continuing to push forward with developing the standards that are needed and updating the standards as they get out of date, those that already exist. In other words, get involved in that process. Uh, one key change which took place not long ago was the addition of qualifications or requirements for movement of fire stop systems. Something pe people have been asking the question for many years, so now we have some requirements on that. Recently, the, the uh, ULC Canadian standard for fire stops, S10, I'm sorry, S115, was revised to incorporate ASM E2307 for the evaluation of perimeter fire containment systems. So now we have, at least from the perspective of the standards, harmonized requirements between Canada and the US. You know, what else can be done to harmonize those sort of requirements? Here's something that's been a question for a lot of years, and that would be, how do we evaluate membrane penetrations of horizontal assemblies? I can remember, probably 1993, Chris Johnson and I put together draft requirements for UL 1479 for evaluating membrane penetrations through horizontal assemblies. Well, both horizontal and vertical assemblies, but primarily from the perspective of the horizontal assemblies, Ultimately, there were so many questions brought up in terms of what should the criteria be? What would the acceptance criteria really look like for that standard that we eventually bailed out and, and abandoned that process? Now Luke is working on that. Uh, it's, uh, I guess the same sort of questions are being asked today as were asked 20 years ago in terms of what should the qualifications be or requirements. Is it unexposed surface temperatures on the top side of that wood floor, for example, or is it temperatures in the concealed space? Or is it a structural collapse of the assembly? How should we be looking at those? So uh, we need to keep moving that process forward and ultimately get to requirements in the standard for that uh, type of uh, assembly. 
Another joint system that perhaps needs to be addressed is the intersection of a rated wall to the exterior curtain wall. And uh, you know, right now the code says you stuff that joint with material that will stay in place and prevent free passage of flames and hot gases. But what does that really mean? I don't think I know. If I was a code official, I certainly wouldn't know. So we, perhaps we need to develop a test standard on that. And I would see that as very much the same sort of situation as the, head, the continuity head of wall joint standard, ASTME 2837. You know, you had non-rated barrier in one case, rated in the other. So, so perhaps it's appropriate to develop a test standard covering that intersection point. You know, the other question is, you know, what should our product directories look like? You know, back in the day when most of us got started in the business, UL and the other laboratories, Megapoint and Warnock Hersey and so on, published paper directories, right? Well, UL stopped publishing paper directories in 2016. We now have electronic directories. We've had electronic directories since 1999, but as of last year, we now have a third generation electronic directory we call UL Product IQ. It's a much more in, uh, robust search engine platform and also we have individual search pages that relate to those areas of fire resistance that we're involved with with this group fire stops joints perimeter etc cetera, etc cetera. so we have dedicated pages with custom written search criteria that allows us to zero in on exactly what systems meet our specific needs so it's great for the designers and for that matter for the manufacturers but uh, you know i was the primary liaison between the fire protection department at UL and our computer programs and programmers in Overland Park, Kansas, and I was feeding them 10, 15 page line items of suggested programming features that we needed incorporated into this. And uh, I, they did a good job. They probably incorporated about 50% of my suggestions, which I thought was actually a pretty good ratio. But clearly there's improvements and you know, I challenge each and every one of you to feed that information back to UL in terms of how we can improve this product IQ database to make it more user for you, user friendly for you and your customers. And you can do that one of two ways. If you're a manufacturer, have direct contact with a UL engineer, let them know. Beyond that though, there's a little green feedback tab on the, every page of product IQ. Just click on that and provide your feedback, provide your suggestions on how we can improve that. Not we, how they can improve it. I do that all the time. I'm no longer with you else, not we, they. Anyway, uh, moving on, you know, what should the certifications look like? You know, my old department, Codes and Regulatory Services, we're the group that took those technical inquiries from the architects, contractors, and code officials. So we had a lot of interaction with those folks and, and trying to understand what their needs are. And uh, we had a lot of conversations over the years about, you know, I call it enhanced fire resistive designs, enhanced fire stop systems, where it was, the, the database was interactive. As a designer, as an architect, I'd say, okay, I want to start with design number U305, which may have realistically 20 ways of building that wall. So now let's start identifying specifically which of the parameters of that assembly I want to use. Once you clicked on one parameter, it would gray out any parameters that were no longer compatible. And then you'd ultimately end up with a very specific set of build instructions on how you'd build that wall. And that would be what would be submitted under plan review. But beyond that, okay, now that we know how that wall is being, going to be constructed, we know we're going to need to protect penetrations. So now we click another tab on, on the screen, and it's going to take us to all fire stop systems which are compatible with that specific wall assembly that was identified. And then we take that to the joint systems. We do that for the doors and for the damper. So the computer ultimately does all that hard searching for you and leaves you with a very well-defined set of criteria that would be submitted to the building department. So is that useful? I would think it would be. But, you know, again, make your needs known. If things like that would be useful. You know, there's certainly, you know, people at UL would be interested in hearing that. Cross-laminated cross timber is a big opportunity for this industry. I heard this mentioned this morning, late in the morning. Uh, you know, we now have code requirements for tall wood buildings up to, I believe it's 20 or the 21 stories in height. So uh, that you know, opens up the door to a completely different type of construction, typically using cross-laminated timber. So you know, we need, we need uh, designs, we need systems covering those products. So uh, it's an opportunity for the industry. Uh, Education, you know, endless opportunities to educate. You know, 
Uh, in my era of dealing with code officials, we pretty much had a complete turnover of the individuals enforcing the codes with the downturn in 08. A lot of the folks that were enforcing the codes left the industry, we now have new people, and it's a continual revolving door. So we can need to continue that education process. So we need to think of smart ways of doing that, economical ways of doing that. And Bryce Miller is on the road continually training code officials and uh, likewise UL is, I was previously, hopefully will continue to be as a consultant. But uh, anyway, we need to continue that process and then also work smarter on how to do that. So ultimately, you know, the future possibilities are endless. You know, use your imagination, think out of the box. How can we, or what, what new Ideas can we bring to this industry? You know, 3D printed fire stops, perhaps. You know, UL has investigated a 3D printed building, actually, built to the residential code requirements. Uh, embedding, you know, RF sensors into the fire stop systems in lieu of those paper labels that everyone seems to have a hardship of getting into the codes. Yeah, you know, I've argued for that for many, many years, and it, it falls on deaf ears. It's turned down every code cycle, but maybe. Another form of identifying those systems might be appropriate. So bottom line is, uh, you know, the future looks promising. There's a lot that needs, still needs to be done to move this industry forward. You folks have uh, been part of that process for years. We need to continue that momentum, continue to build on what we've built for the last 30 years. And, uh, you know, the future really, as always, depends on what you bring, into the, bring to the table today to build that future. So thank you very much. Now a couple minutes over, but uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, my contact information is here on the screen. Feel free to reach out to me. You know, I'm, I am consulting, so I'm continuing to work. That phone number, by the way, is my old UL cell phone number. So please take advantage of it, use it. You know, even if you just want to call and say hello, I'd be happy to talk with you. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll, if you have any questions at this point, let's address whatever questions you might have.